Welcome to today's program, Solutions in Action. Uh, my name is Kevin Ordonez. I'm the co-founder of Dowdor Community, along with my business partner, Sherry Budziak. This is a very critical time for associations to more, work more efficiently and to partner with the right solutions. And this is why we put together this program today to provide you with an overview of some of the best solutions in the association industry. So Sherry and I created .org Community over six years ago based on an overwhelming need for association leaders who were looking for connections that count, uh, meaningful mastermind groups where peers can problem solve together, and opportunities to participate in our innovative think tanks and to experience relevant and timely education. In addition, our member subscribers have access to more than 250 online educational programs. And you can try us out for free for 30 days. Just go to .orgcommunity.com to learn more. So last summer, Sherry and I launched our Solution Center, which is a year round virtual exhibit. Visitors can go to solutions.orgcommunity.com and search for solutions, view product sheets, case studies, testimonials, and even schedule an appointment. All of our guest thought leaders today can be found on our solution center. Also just a reminder to save the date. This is one of our signature in-person events scheduled for November 10th in Schaumburg, Illinois at ASA. Uh, we will sell out since space is limited. So please don't miss this one of a kind educational and networking opportunity. We're also excited to announce our Association 4.0 podcast. And Association 4.0 is how we describe the skills needed to navigate today's digital marketplace. So I hope you check us out um, on our episodes in our podcast. So just a few logistics before we get started. Um, if you would like to ac access the recordings of today's webinar, as well as our past ones. And again, if you're not a member, again, you can just join for 30 days to get that access. Um, everyone is on mute at the start of this webinar. Uh, feel free to submit your questions and comments via the chat throughout the presentations. And then when we get to the Q&A session, uh, please use the Q&A box in Zoom to submit your question for the um, end Q&A session. Uh, we, can, we want to continue the conversation, so please use hashtag org webinar and tag us on social media. Uh, now I want to introduce my good friend and fellow consultant, Steve Welsh, who will be our MC for this morning's program. All right, well, thanks, Kevin, and, and thanks, Sherry. Um, I'm Steve Welch. I'm uh, a senior consultant here at OrgSource, and today I'm gonna be hosting today's Org Community Program of Solutions in Action. Now, Solutions in Action is really designed to provide ideas that you all can use right away to try to build revenue, grow member engagement, and, and really position your organization for success. Next slide. You know, the quick paced webinar today, we're gonna to include presentations that are focusing on strategies for maximizing content platforms. And we're gonna be looking at video, uh, websites, virtual events, and leveraging customer data platforms, as well as business intelligence. Now, as somebody who spent my career in association leadership, um, I, I was involved a lot with content management, with publishing, uh, with uh, all, all levels of association management. I'm really excited to hear about some of the innovations that we're gonna be looking at today. Next slide, please. Now our presenters are gonna be, they're gonna be looking through the lens of technology as they're presenting today. But before we get there, I wanna take a couple of minutes and talk a little bit about 
about content management from a strategic point of view. And you know, as a seasoned association executive and, and former CEO of the American College of Chest Physicians, you know, I headed divisions and business units that were responsible for uh, a lot of areas related to content, you know, publishing, marketing, communications, membership, IT, uh, international programs. Um, and so uh, today we're really gonna hear from a, a, a several different solutions partners that are gonna have some really interesting things to talk to you about. Next slide, please. So, you know, after, after spending 25 years in association management, you know, I really understand how important it is for an enti entire organization to work together. And, so, you know, we talk a lot about silos. Silos, you know, they're more than just a problem. You know, for organizations like ours, they're, they're really a business liability. And systems and teams really have to partner toward common goals. And that's where content strategy comes in, right? Content strategy gets everybody moving in the right direction. And a lot of Marcom people are familiar with the term of content strategy, but for anybody who needs a little bit of a refresher uh, or some clarity, the, the content strategy alliance has a really nice definition. And they say content strategy is basically getting the right content to the right user at the right time through strategic planning of content creation, delivery, and governance. And I think it's important that we're looking at those three pieces. It's not just about creating content. It's also making sure you've got the strategy on how to deliver it and also the governance around that content. Next slide, please. Now, occasionally there's some confusion. What's content management and how does that differ from content marketing? So next slide, let's talk a little bit about that. You know, a content strategy is really the, the you know, that's a high level piece that, that, that provides the policies and procedures that ensure that you're developing the right content as well as the communications and messages around it. And all of that needs to be tied to your business goals and your strategic goals. Next slide, please. Whereas you look at content marketing, content marketing is really an outcome of the strategy, right? It, it, it includes things like the roadmap. So think about things like search engine optimization um, and things like perks. Uh, if you provide downloadable free content to sort of catch people's interest, pique their interest so that it brings them into your organization, your website, your webinars like today, the, all those types of things, you know, along with a variety of other activities that are designed to promote relationship building. And you know, with, the, with the marketing, uh, it's really the goal is to generate leads, to develop some brand loyalty, and hopefully turn um, some of those potential prospects or those interested parties into members and, and engaged members of your organization. And without a deliberate intention or strategy, um, you know, me as a, a, I'm also a, a fitness nutrition coach, if, if you do all these things without really having a strategy, it's kind of like consuming empty calories, right? It, it's going to deplete your energy and stunt your progress and your growth. The next slide, please. So a content strategy, you know, it, having the discipline to treat content strategically can, can be difficult, um, but there's a lot of rewards for those who are willing to put in the effort and take that journey. And a content strategy is gonna align your goals, for example. It's gonna align goals in the strategic plan uh, with your content output across your departments. It's gonna give the members what they want, when they want it, and then format prefer. You know, going back to our definition that we just heard. It's gonna deliver value and increase relevance it's going to help your organization to continue evolving to meet the needs of your target audiences and your membership. And it's going to encourage collaboration and teamwork throughout your organization. Now, each of these points is, is by themselves reason enough to consider doing a, a well-defined content strategy. But just how do you do that? And where do you start? Next slide. Well, like all things, you know, they, a lot of things start at the top. So launching and sustaining a really effective strategic initiative really begins with the CEO and the executive leadership. The leaders have to be champions. Uh, you've got to connect the business strategy with the content strategy and the marketing and really advocate and embrace uh, and enforce an organization-wide approach. And that they, they've got to be able to reward success and discourage complacency. They also have to ensure that everybody has the tools they need because with any venture, any initiative that your organization takes on, uh, you've got to have the right, uh, allocate the right financial, technological, and human resources. 
Now, with once you've got the CEO and the leadership on board, the responsibility for implementation can, can then be shifted over to a content strategy team. Now, this group should have a, a really good understanding of the organization's strategic plan, and they've got to represent your key stakeholders. They're going to be the ambassadors for the initiative. And ideally, they should have the following. You know, they've got to have a champion first and foremost. And that's somebody who prioritizes the activities, who guides the project and is sort of the primary spokesperson. And then a manager kind of directs the team. And then you've got to have some interdepartmental representatives. And they're the ones who are going to coordinate some work groups across the organization to make sure everybody's moving forward uh, in, in a concerted effort toward the, the goals and also identify and remove obstacles to progress within the organization. Next slide, please. Now, although every association has different goals and different areas of specialty, you know, the purpose of content strategy is the same. Look, without content, your association is really just a social club. And while networking is, is really important and often, often it's a really big reason that our members like to get together and be part of our organization, it's not a substitute for expertise and trusted authority. And a content strategy really defines that value and it helps determine your relationship with your members and your different audiences. The, the thing is the digital marketplace is just full of nilis. You know, there's so much out there. And in that sort of crowded competition, a content strategy is going to make your association a trusted voice of authority. Uh, it's something that your members are going to be eager to hear, that they know they can trust, that they know is going to be good quality. That's, that's where um, helping your organization balance content creation with content curation really provides meaningful be benefit to your members and to those audiences. So the key to that, or one of the big keys to that, of course, is having the right channels and the right platforms and the right insights so that you can really effectively deliver on that strategy and, and on the, all those initiatives. And that's really what takes us to today's webinar. So next slide, please. I'm going to go ahead and start uh, our, our, our introducing our partners. You know, they've each one of them has got some content solutions that we believe will help you put your best voice, your best content forward on whatever platform you're looking at. So our first guest is going to be Doug Coombs. Uh, he's the director of client solutions at Association TV, and Doug's going to talk to us a little bit about making the most of video projects. So Doug, you're on. Thank you, Stephen. That is the ultimate segue into what we were going to talk about. Now that you know the why you've got that content, and thank you, Kevin, Sherry, they, uh, everyone involved in, in making today happen. Um, but now that you know the why you need a content strategy, some people might be like, and the people that are involved, the stakeholders, the how important it is to get interdepartmental buy-in for that goal, there's the how. And today, uh, I'm going to speak about specifically about lowering the cost of your video projects. I'm going to focus on that front end part of it, filming. Uh, that, although we, you know, Worker BTV is the name of our company. Association TV is a trademark service that we offer specifically for associations. And we're a video production house. So we've got uh, remote filming technology, which I'm going to go over today. And we're also video editors. We can help complement your content strategy. And then we've got some online platforms that can help you get that in front of the right people at the right time. Today, we're focusing specifically on video. Uh, feel free to chat. Uh, you can scan that QR code to connect with me in LinkedIn. I'd be happy to share these slides with you after. Uh, just hit me up. So go right into the facts here. So members want high quality content. Uh, we all know that. We, they want to be informed, educated, and inspired. Um, and, you know, they need that validation that it comes from the association. So um, why aren't people doing video? Uh, there's a lot of reasons why. Maybe it's there's barriers there. Perhaps it's too expensive. There's too much planning needed. Uh, if you're going that free route or using those online meeting platforms to capture some, some videos, maybe it's not that quality that you're going for. Uh, the speaker support, it's tough. Uh, you know, there's COVID makes it tough for a film crew to go somewhere. A lot of associations that we've always worked with uh, capture a lot of their content at their events. So they've got all their subject matter experts, their members, the association staff, they're all at one place. That's the annual event. And with those not happening and with reduced attendance, it's getting harder to do that now. And that's another thing that we also help with. But uh, what we do is what we're doing now is trying to fill in the gap for that. And geography plays a role in this too. 
um, a lot of international speakers. Uh, they're not traveling a lot right now. And that might play a role in why not video. Um, if you could think of a video that you have not done, I'd love to hear. Uh, you can connect with me in LinkedIn and let me know or just toss it in the chat. But I think everyone, including ourselves, sometimes we haven't done a video because of these reasons. So we'd love to know that. So what's the solution? It's called Virtual Videographer. And uh, I'll just show a quick little video here and I'll speak to it so that we can go into it. Oh, sorry. So Virtual Videographer is a remote filming service with professional guidance. It allows us to film in 4K quality without anyone having to travel. We can film through an iPhone, iPad, or webcam. And with very minimal equipment, we can get up to 4K quality for your videos. We're also getting professional quality audio. This interface here shows you what you, the association professional, can actually be logged in as a collaborator to make sure that content aligns with that strategy. This here is our virtual videographer. Yes, that's the name of a service we offer, but that's also a job title here. We have people that do this day in and day out. And their main focus is cap capturing high quality video and providing an exceptional service to your speakers to make sure they're supported throughout the whole route. Uh, sometimes people are like, oh, we're filming through an iPhone? Interesting. And there might be a little doubt there, but then they see the quality of this and they're blown away because it's a lot different than what people are used to when they're doing an online recording. We can do four subjects at a time. So think about your fireside chats or any sort of collaborative presentations that you're doing. That's no problem. And they don't need to be in the same room. Everyone can be in their city, anywhere in the world. We have complete control of everything. So as you can see down here, we're controlling the uh, visuals on there. So the audio, the temperature of the color, the coloring, the lighting. And we can turn the device into a teleprompter as well. So if you have a very specific marketing message or an advocacy video, we can use the, the teleprompter for that. Go back to the slides here. So we're really taking down the cost and time required to capture high quality video without sacrificing the quality. So how does it work? So we log in to the speaker's device and we can control all of their camera settings. We do have a list of equipment we'd be happy to share. Uh, you can scan my QR code at the end and connect with me on LinkedIn or uh, feel free to chat and we'd be happy to share. But there is some equipment that we recommend and it's so inexpensive to just buy straight from Amazon. That's usually what we do. We're going to capture 4K quality and how we do that is we're using the internet to communicate with the speakers. But what we're doing is we're actually recording it directly into the device. So uh, the newer iPhones, we can capture 4K from the front camera, most iPhones from the back camera and the audio quality. So the MP4, is completely unaffected by any sort of bandwidth or internet speed issues because it's loaded directly onto the device. And when the recording session's over, it goes to our cloud. Once it's on the cloud securely, it actually deletes itself from the device where we can begin editing right away, or we can share that with, uh, with you if you have editing resources in-house. So we're cutting down the time and cost. It's really easy. Like I mentioned, it's a main objective of, of ours to make sure that the service throughout this whole process is next to none because um, it's new to a lot of speakers. We're not compromising quality and we can do this anywhere at any time. So we can start, it, it's very easy to uh, serve people and match to their schedules because we have uh, three full-time virtual videographers. I'd love to know if you have any ideas on how you could use virtual videographer, uh, we learn the most from our clients and they're awesome ideas. So please feel free to hit, do the chat or, uh, or hit me up on LinkedIn with that. A lot of our clients are doing those advocacy videos, member communications with member profiles. I'll get a little into that right away. Internal communications, volunteer thank yous, just those little things that go a long way, especially when the leaders take the time to make a video and um, educational award videos, client testimonials. We've been doing a lot of different uh, use cases with this. That's been really fun since, uh, since 2019 when we launched this. And we've really learned uh, how to execute this to get these videos the highest possible quality. One that we've been doing that kind of hits those three R's, 
and that's recruitment and retention and revenue. And that's tying into what Stephen had mentioned at the, at the top here. Um, what's the strategy? So a member profile video is shot with vir virtual videographer, helps with a lot of different things. And don't think of this as a testimonial, it's a story. Your members have the best stories. That's exclusive content that only your association can offer. And it's just so good for everybody because you're educating them with long form educational sessions or micro learning. You're informing your members with that communication. So if it's a leadership update or some sort of advocacy, they need to know. So you need to keep them informed and inspire them with something like that member profile where they, they share the failures and how the associations help them turn that around into something successful and how important the association has been to them in their career. If you could put yourself in your members' shoes, how would you like to con consume content? Everyone's a little different. And um, me personally, I'm an audio and I'll listen to very long form content when I'm walking the dog, but I love a video, like a short form micro learning video. So if you guys toss that in the chat, I can't see them right now, but I'll check them out later or at the end when we do the Q and A, but just put yourself in your members' shoes and think about how you would like to consume content. Are you a reader? Do you print it off and read it? I don't know, everyone's a little different. But when you start with a high quality video, it makes all of those possible. When you, when you have that raw MP4 and that you can be used later for a podcast. Um, so when you have that full length interview, imagine you interviewed your member for 30 minutes and you went in and you can have, we can record simultaneously so you can have a consistent interviewer and your members as the interviewee. But when you have that full length recording, we can easily turn that into a two to three minute micro learning video. And from there, it's even simpler to go to social media video. So now we're taking people from your platforms into your brand where they get exclusive content that they can't get anywhere else besides your, uh, your organization. High quality video makes it simple and easy to go to audio as well. So you can go from that full form 30 minute audio version of that member profile or interview telling the story of why they're a member and how that you've helped them. From there, it's real simple. Again, you've got PowerPoint slides, there's blogs or articles, PDFs, and then text-based pull quote social medias that all come from one 30 to 45 minute interview. Now you're helping with the how that Stephen was talking about earlier. The why is big. The how is lots of moving parts, but made simple with virtual videographer. After that, you can create those breadcrumbs, right? So you're pulling people from those social networks. You're casting that wide net with your content. Members are seeing it and they're coming to re-engage. Non-members are seeing it and they're coming to see what's up. They're coming to see what's so good about this association. And then they're gonna hear from members why it's so good and why they're still members and why they love networking. The social thing is huge, but education too, exclusivity, that uh, validation that it's from the association. And then you can make that those long form things gated. Um, our platform does make this easy, but we're not here to talk about our, our, our multimedia platforms today. We're talking about how video can help create that strategy, help fulfill that strategy. So it's about free and try before you buy. So we'll get into some of the brass tacks. Um, do more for less. Um, so for with virtual videographer, Video helps you do all of this. And I think we've all learned, if we didn't know before 2020, um, video is a very great vehicle to increase your reach, improve your engagement, educate members, communicate to members and non-members. And even internally, we have clients that use video to communicate to their large organizations because they're so big. Video just helps them do that efficiently with, with, uh, with, with personal, personality and care into that. And as well, video is always monetizable. You can have brought to you by content. Um, the platform that we have does allow for like other forms of sponsorship as well. There's the learning management side of things. So you always want to think about why you're doing the video and then how we can get all of this done. So we'll ask questions like, is there something else we can do while we're interviewing this member? Is it possible that they can speak to your upcoming event? And then we can, you know, have 30 seconds, they read a teleprompter, and then all of a sudden you have something you have a marketing video and you're interviewing them on something else. So we'll always help with that as well. So what's included with virtual videographer? 
Of course, there's speaker support. As I mentioned, that's a big measure, measurement for us. It's to make sure the speaker walks out of there feeling good and they want to do it again. We'll do a 60 minute recording and that can go in up to 4K. 30 minute prep. So before that recording, we're going to do a 30 minute prep call with the speakers. The collaborators can be there as well, just to make sure everything's working the way it should. Usually that's about two to three days before, just a quick check-in. And that's just really helps us uh, make sure that when it's time to record, they focus on the content, nothing technical. Steven, I see you're turning on your camera, so it must, must be my cue. <laughs> you can do four collators, four speakers, and this is just for $495, everyone. So thank you. Scan that QR code. The timing was actually pretty good, Steven. Thank you. And uh, connect with me in LinkedIn. I'd be happy to share these slides or, uh, or, or meet with you, anyone one on one after this. So thanks, everyone. And thanks, Steven. Oh, yeah, Doug, thank you. That was fantastic. And as an old school uh, com communications and, and journalist, uh, I, I find this stuff really fascinating. A couple of questions. Somebody had popped one up on in the, and we've got a couple minutes yet. Um, yep. they, one of the questions was, do you do subtitles and closed captions on the videos? Yeah, we do. Yes, okay. we, we can. Uh, um, open caption, closed caption, different languages. Of course, just that, just the planning just changes a tiny bit, but absolutely we can help with that. Yeah, let me follow up on that because I have clients who do a lot of international work and I've done so in the past. Like, what, how, Also, how do you um, provide translation uh, services for some of those things? Um, well, there, there's always an AI way to do for certain languages, mm -hmm. but then it goes into our network and through our network of videographers, we have tons of local contacts and then we'll leverage that. So depending on the language, recently we did one in Mandarin. Wow. And okay. that was just a few emails and then just kind of work out the logistics of when the video will be ready and approved for transcription. And then it's just a matter of working into our workflow. So we always work backwards from when do you need this by? And we work all of that in working into our clients uh, need to review things. I'm not sure if that answered your question though, Stephen. Yeah, no, that's helpful. Thank you. Perfect. Um, all right. Well, I think uh, we'll probably move on to the next one. Stick around. Maybe we'll have time at the end for a few more questions. Thanks a lot, Doug. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much, everyone. I appreciate it. And uh, thanks. Thanks, our community. I can stop share here. Oh, hey, are you there the whole time? <laughs> Kevin, are, Kevin, are you popping these back up or do I need to introduce? I'll go ahead and introduce the next, the next person. Um, you know, the, next we've got um, Garrett Grant. Garrett is the Vice President of Client Services and the Association Practice Lead at Valier. Uh, he's also gonna be uh, presenting with Brad Powell, who's a Senior Alliance and Channel Partner Manager at Site Improve. And Garrett and Brad are gonna outline uh, a lot of the reasons why your website needs to be accessible. So let's take it from there and we'll jump into some accessibility discussions. Thanks so much. Can everyone see the screen okay? Yes. Excellent. Um, thanks so much for the introduction, Stephen. Um, my name is Garrett Grant. I think we're, we're on a roll here with segues is the, the, the question around um, closed captions and, and transcripts falls uh, right in line with, with what we're talking about here. And, um, you know, as Stephen said, what, what we're here to talk about is, uh, you know, the top reasons why uh, your website needs to be accessible and then um, getting into some, some thought starters and, and quick steps uh, to start breaking down those barriers to, to making that possible for, for your association. So um, uh, as, as Stephen said, my name is Garrett Grant, I'm the VP of Client Services and Associations Practice Lead at Valir. We're a full service digital agency. Um, so we work uh, very closely with a lot of our, our clients um, to, uh, to work through accessibility goals. Um, and in order to do that, we work with uh, partners like Site Improve and, and that's where Brad comes in and I'd love to let him introduce himself as well. Hi everyone. Pleasure to be with you all this morning. My name is Brad Powell. As Garrett referenced uh, with Site Improve, we have been uh, a technology partner with the Valier Agency for a good numbers of year, a good number of years, helping to support their clients on their uh, digital accessibility journeys. So, um, just laying some context really quick, a little bit about Valier. We're based in Somerville, Massachusetts, um, which is right near. Boston and Cambridge, um, right around uh, Tufts University. And um, we are a full service digital agency. And um, that really lends, uh, uh, it makes it very um, good to have those services in house to uh, help our clients with accessibility because accessibility touches every discipline um, that you have from, from strategy to, to UX to design. 
um, to uh, to development and to, to QA and testing. So to have all of those resources in house and with the ability to communicate with each other, um, that makes uh, that that makes the process much easier um, and and much more streamlined for for our clients and and for us as well. Um, but a huge part of that is also our, our partners like Site Proof. And uh, just a little bit of extra context uh, about who Site Improve is for everyone. Uh, we were founded nearly 20 years ago, actually headquartered globally in Copenhagen, Denmark. Um, I'm here in Minneapolis, which is where our stateside uh, office is in the, uh, the United States. We're a software as a service solution that kind of layers on top of your existing website to really give it a digital health check. Um, and one of the components of what our platform is checking for is your website accessibility to make sure that it uh, is, is inclusively designed uh, as possible to reach the broadest audience. Awesome. And I think um, what we're ready to get into now is those top five reasons why uh, your, your association website should be accessible. So getting into reason number one. Yeah, I'll run through these uh, these five reasons here pretty quick, just mainly from the lens of bringing some awareness to the importance of uh, web accessibility. Uh, we won't necessarily dive into any technicalities of how our solution works in conjunction with how Valir delivers that uh, today, but we can certainly uh, use that as a follow up uh, uh, if anyone is interested. So from an awareness standpoint, um, web accessibility is important because it, it, it really should be considered as, well, first and foremost, your website is your primary uh, digital presence. And you want to make sure that it has the ability to reach the broadest audience. Statistically, 10 to 20 percent, upwards of 20 percent of uh, uh, the population has some sort of disability that uh, inhibits their uh, their success in navigating your website without some sort of uh, assistive technology. So if you can make that content that Steve referenced in the beginning uh, available to everyone, you have the opportunity to increase your audience for your association. So it's, it's just kind of good best practice to make that your website as accessible to everyone as possible. And then uh, alongside that, these uh, somewhat go hand in hand, but it, it's, it just provides a better all over, uh, overall user experience for the people that are interacting with your website. If, I, if you put yourself in the lens of uh, having a visual impairment, as an example, and you're using some sort of assistive technology to tab through uh, with a screen reader and interact with that content on the page, if you have trouble navigating or you come to an image on the screen but you there's no alternative text written in the code behind that image you might grow frustrated and just quit your website experience altogether and, and leave um, so it's important just to consider as your website is designed as it's maintained that you're uh, uh, doing it with a good user experience in mind from an accessibility standpoint Go ahead, Garrett, thanks. <clears throat> Web accessibility also ties into your organic search uh, results. Search algorithms are becoming more and more complex. And uh, that example that I referenced earlier with the image with no alternative text, um, that actually can uh, either positively or negatively uh, impact your search rankings from an SEO standpoint. Uh, reason number four, we don't necessarily like to focus on this, but it is a reality. Uh, there are certain standards that uh, the uh, W3C, which is the governing body that dictates what uh, website accessibility guidelines are, as well as in the United States, there's obviously the uh, uh, American Disabilities Act. Uh, more and more increasing uh, numbers of lawsuits are being brought against organizations for uh, website 
non-accessibility compliance to those guidelines. Uh, they aren't hard and fast rules. There's a lot of gray area to it. We at Site Improve, and I'm sure Garrett would attest to this from a Valier standpoint, aren't necessarily here to give legal counsel on that, but know that the platform that we provide does help organizations live up to what those expectations are across the compliance ADA as well as WICA guidelines. And then lastly, as uh, you all are considering your, uh, your website, your primary digital presence, if you are going to embark on a journey of ensuring that your website is built and maintained with accessibility in mind, my recommendation is to, uh, whether it's Site Improve or a different tool set out there, um, choose a, sool, a, a tool set that will equip your employees uh, with various uh, degrees of skill set, whether a content contributor, a content editor, uh, a developer, um, and one that can actually give educational insights into what the issues are and why those issues are arising uh, against the conformance levels for ADA or WICA guidelines. And then it can also give you guidance on how you should actually go remediate that um, because web accessibility isn't necessarily just a, a one-time fix. It's a ongoing event that as your content changes on your, uh, on your website that you should continually, continuously be monitoring for. Thanks, Brad. And I think um, that that takes us to all right. So, what what do we do with with this information, and and how do associations take uh, steps towards improving accessibility? And I think one of the things that um, that we've seen over the years is is people are at different starting points in terms of uh, of accessibility, both with you know the the state of their current digital presence, you know, starting with their website, all the way to the familiarity with accessibility guidelines that you have in house on your staff. Um, so what we like to talk through with our clients are, are, are breaking things out and unpacking a little bit what you need to think about and what you need to do in order to be successful here and put together a plan that is going to set you up to be, have the right level of accessibility for your audience. Um, the first step that we like to, to help our clients with is aligning on accessibility goals. Um, as Brad mentioned, um, you know, there's there's different levels of WCAG guide, guidelines and, and WCAG is the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, which are, are published by um, the WC3, the World Wide Web Consortium. Um, and so there's there's different uh, levels and tiers of accessibility. And, and the first thing we like to do is, is, and we ask our clients to pay attention to those guidelines um, and make sure that some of those clients make, or make sure that what, which requirements are important for your organization to hit um, and what level is you're comfortable with being at. And, and taking a look at some of those requirements and, and making sure they're realistic for your organization. And if they're not realistic, why? Um, and that way we can start to take the steps to putting a roadmap forward um, to, to being able to achieve them in the future as well. From there, once we know our goals, we recommend that, uh, that a checklist is made. You know, like I mentioned earlier, accessibility touches so many disciplines in the process from design and UX to, to front end and, and back end. And it, it's important that people both on your team or, or any partners that you're working with know who's accountable for what. Um, and that those people understand what's needed and what the goals are, um, because it's really important that they be able to communicate with each other um, and really important that they be able to uh, work with the rest of the team to be able to um, pass things off, hand things off, work together, check, test things together. Um, so that's a really important part is roles and responsibilities. Another thing that, that we recommend is, is both automated and manual testing uh, for accessibility. I think automated testing tools like, um, like the one that Site Improve provides, it provides you with readouts, with tangible steps um, to, to improve your accessibility and, and where your room for improvement is uh, right now. But there's also a value to qualitative feedback as well um, for, we did the mass.gov um, website, which isn't an association, but um, it has a, a wide breadth of users that are going to be touching their site. So we actually partnered with the Perkins School for the Blind um, and had uh, many of their students go ahead and test the website. And what that provided was even with um, certain, certain experiences that checked the boxes from a 
uh, WCAG level of, uh, of standard to make sure that we were providing the right level of accessibility. Um, we also got just qualitative experience feedback the, and that gave us the opportunity to improve the experience for, um, for every user of the website, uh, similar to the way that, um, you know, I'd say uh, traditional user testing applies. Um, one other piece to, to remember too is, is content. Um, I think a lot of times accessibility, the, the, the assumptions and, the, and the, the things that come to mind are, are focused in the design uh, area and, and in the technology side, but, but content is an equally important piece, making sure that page titles are thought through so that they can be useful to your users. Uh, reading level comes into play. Um, content, and, and as Brad mentioned, SEO is, um, is, is, a, is a lever that moves with accessibility. And so uh, that's a piece to keep in mind as well. And, and last but not least, uh, it's not a project. It's not something that you invest six months in and, and you're done and you're accessible. It's, it's an ongoing journey. It's a process, um, as we like to say. And, and for that, we, we like to, to make sure that your staff is, is constantly staying up to speed on, on what the latest uh, rules and regulations around accessibility are, making sure that testing is part of your regular digital website maintenance um, so that when new things are added, whether it's features or content, that you're staying on top of those things. Um, so we've worked with a number of, uh, of different associations in different ways. And, and the one thing that I can say too, is the most important next step you can take is just to start to talk with your internal staff or talk with your partner, any partners you work with, any agencies you work with, um, and ask what, what do we need to do to get, um, to, to, to be accessible? What do we need to do? Where, where should we go from here? Um, and start with those first two steps of, of identifying what those goals should be and making that checklist. Um, and you'd be surprised how much you can accomplish uh, in a short order of time. Um, one client of ours with, uh, that we worked with Site Improve on, uh, we redesigned the National Association of Home Builders um, site using Site Improve and accessibility best practices. And we um, were able to win the American Website uh, Design Award um, in 2020. Um, so that's about it. Um, I think one thing that we wanted to let people know is that uh, if you go to vlear.com slash contact, if you're interested in a free accessibility site audit, we'd be happy to, uh, to provide that. Um, Brad, if you want to touch on uh, what's in that really quick. Yeah, sure. You're just looking at a, uh, a couple screenshots of a deliverable that uh, will result of this uh, site audit. Uh, so the site improved platform uh, will scan for your technical SEO your web accessibility and uh, quality assurance, uh, and then score it uh, across an average number, which we call our digital certainty index. So we'd be happy to run a scan um, and show you some results and perhaps uh, talk you through some suggestions of how we could uh, help uh, uh, remediate some of those accessibility issues on your sites. Yeah, and thank you all very much for your time. Uh, we hope you found this valuable and, and feel free to reach out to Brad or I with any questions. Hey, thanks, guys. That was great. I appreciate that. Um, as, as somebody who, I, it's funny, I grew up in a small town in Illinois. It happened to be the, um, the, the home of the Illinois State School for the Deaf and also the Illinois State, State School for the Visually Impaired. So uh, these kind of things, I think, are really important. Uh, and, and it's a great, a, a great thing that you're doing to make people aware of, of accessibility issues and how important that is. Um, I think we're, we need to move on to the next client, unless, Sherry, uh, we have time for a quick question. I know, I know one person posted, they just said, hey, is this um, something that you really need to hire for or is this something that can be matrixed through your staff? And uh, maybe we, you guys can answer that real quick before we move on. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, you know, I've, seen, I've seen people do both. Um, I think it always helps um, to, it's, I, think, I think it's easier to, um, you know, on a, on a given project, you can assign someone as having the role of being, um, you know, a uh, in charge of accessibility and, and making sure that those objectives get monitored. Um, I haven't seen as many, you know, accessibility directors or, or, or roles like that. It's more your your content um, or marketing or, or digital directors within an organization that um, take on the effort of being trained there and, and understanding what the important levels are. Um, I think it is an important uh, discipline to, uh, to train up across multiple roles in your organization. 
Um, and sometimes that's not doable in, a, in an immediate fashion to get up to speed to where you need to be to, you know, to meet a specific project's objective. And, you know, that's where, you know, partners like Folio or Site Improve can come in and, um, and provide that expertise quickly. But long term, it should be uh, an objective, I'd say, of any association. It's, it's not going away. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks, guys. That was really that was really informative. Appreciate you coming on and doing this. I think now we're going to move on. Um, next up, we've got John Chalice, and John is the senior vice president of, of business development at Hum. Uh, John's going to talk about how Hum can change lives using customer data and and intelligence. And I can't wait to hear this because uh, obviously analytics and, and and data are are something that's on everybody's that's on uh, on everybody's mind. So, John, take it away. Thank you so much, and uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I am uh, just going to pop my screen in here. And... Slideshow. Sorry, guys. The Zoom thing is um, screen. There we go. Slideshow. Okay. okay. <clears throat> well, it probably sounds like a very bold uh, statement about improving your lives. Um, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna begin with uh, sort of a bit of a defense of the title and, uh, and just sort of talk about where associations are at. And Steve mentioned this a little bit at the beginning. Um, everybody is on a digital journey at the moment and for all sorts of reasons. And uh, one legitimate question we want you to ask, are associations growing and engaging audiences in the digital area? And, uh, I think it's important we ask the question and answer it honestly. And the honest answer at the moment seems to be mostly no. Uh, last year, 59% of associations across industries reported uh, flat or declining membership. Uh, those 45% uh, reported drops in member renewals, which means people are choosing not to re-engage, which is a kind of a value proposition issue. Um, for associations that saw a decline, the average decline was 9%, which is dangerously close to double digits, and that's, that's a life-changing thing for an association. And uh, when you look at the uh, demographics of association membership, you see a kind of a worrying trend, which is that millennials and Gen Z, which is sort of the, uh, you know, the, 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 the next wave of, uh, of the workforce, only about 20% of association membership uh, are made up of those folks. And this is a big graphic cliff. In 2025, that'll be 75% of the workforce. So right now, four years from there, we have 20, they're representing 20% of our membership. This, this uh, is a, a potential problem. And if, if all of that wasn't enough, then we had COVID. And COVID disrupted uh, among other things, one of the main revenue sources for associations, which tend to be events uh, for many of them. And last year, a lot of associations were able to uh, pivot and, um, and in some cases extract themselves from some financial obligations. And so the, the economic effects weren't as great. I think we're seeing in 2021, that's less true. And uh, we, we need some permanent solutions here. So, so this is kind of the, the the context I think we're, we're dealing with. And anybody who's ever gone to a Walmart knows that uh, if you're looking for children's socks, you know, you walk in the door, everybody has the exact same experience. You have to walk to the same part of the store. That's very different than if you go to walmart.com. Walmart.com or Amazon or Netflix know rather a lot about you. Uh, and everybody who goes has a very, very different experience. And uh, the question, of course, is how, how is that driven? And on the consumer side, business to you know, B2C side, people are used to highly personalized experiences where the companies they're dealing with, the entities they're dealing with know a lot about them and are using that information to feed them stuff that's personalized and relevant. And I think it's important that associations start thinking about, well, what, what do I need to do to be able to do that? How do I provide that value to my memberships? membership? So, um, what do associations need to be able to do this? Uh, the answer in one word is you need data. And more specifically, you need unified first party data. So how does this fit into content strategy? Well, this fits in because it sort of tells you, answers the question about what. What content do I need? Uh, how do I build more valuable content? What are people actually interacting with and people in different segments? 
perhaps those that I'm most interested in seducing into membership or or uh, or or uh, demonstrating value. So uh, that may be sort of a kind of a depressing intro. I, I I just wanted to say you know associations have a lot of valuable assets. So here's kind of a uh, a sense of some of those things. Um, we're going to focus today, obviously, on data. In an analog organization, you know, data um, may or may not be an asset. It's almost certainly siloed. Uh, it sits, you know, maybe uh, much of it in the AMS. It's mostly demographic. A lot of it's zero party, which means it's provided by the members themselves. What we uh, are talking about now, uh, when we talk about data, are, are is really non-demographic data that you observe, first party data. Um, and so it's uh, what makes it strategically important is it as an association, it's data you have that nobody else has, including your emerging competition. And if we had more time, I'd talk about that. Uh, but there are other uh, folks out there who are trying to peel off your membership um, with a disaggregated offer. Uh, a great example would be LinkedIn and, you know, uh, trying to uh, take people who otherwise might be using your job boards. So uh, we, of course, uh, aren't uh, the only people who think you should be thinking about uh, data. And um, uh, this is a quote here from um, Kinsey's Future, Future Personalization Report uh, in 2019. They talk about CDPs. A lot of people haven't heard of CDPs before. It's a, it's a, Customer data platforms are, are, are a new software class that really sort of emerged in 2013. Um, but it is, um, it is the thing that lies at the heart of being able to unify and use your first party. So that's what we're gonna talk about. Um, so here's kind of how it works right now. You have silos. So you have your digital product platforms, which probably your, you know, your events, your, your content management system. You have your marketing technology stack. Um, uh, and LMS actually would be another example of a digital product platform. Uh, then you have your CRM, which is possibly your AMS as well. Uh, what HUM does, uh, or any CDP would do, is it sits in the middle and it, and, it, and it watches for events across all of these, and it collects this information and gives you this um, uh, unified, harmonized, clean data record for each customer. We call it the golden record. Uh, this is done in real time. That's important. Uh, and uh, the uh, integrations are bi-directional, which means that you can use this cleaned up harmonized data to drive other things. And I'm going to talk about a use case of that um, to kind of give you an example and put a little flesh on the bone. So uh, a CDP has uh, sort of four broad use cases within the association uh, world. Uh, you can uh, grow your membership. Uh, you can uh, boost uh, engagement in existing products and programs. You can uh, add, um, or you can use data to, to refine your programs and content. Um, so uh, if you're trying to decide part of the content strategy, what you should be doing more of and maybe possibly what you should be doing less of, uh, uh, obviously, a CDP will be able to help you with that. And you can also increase your non dues revenue by changing completely uh, how you do your sponsorship programs. Stuff that runs all year instead of maybe just once a year at an annual event. Um, new media based uh, content programs that, that, uh, that you can um, have sponsors uh, promote, you can derive revenue from, and that your members actually find uh, useful, helpful, and valuable. So I'm going to talk about one of these. I'm going to talk about number two, uh, boosting enrollment, existing programs and products, um, because I think this is one that almost everybody can uh, easily imagine. And I'm going to walk through exactly what you do, how you do this uh, using HUM. So uh, the first thing you do in uh, HUM is you create a segment uh, of an existing uh, audience. And in this case, uh, I'm going to pick uh, someone that I'm interested in getting my hands on. So I'm going to I'm going to, um, I'm going to uh, move over to live web here and show you a hot second how to build a segment in uh, in Hum. And um, so we're running here on our live site. 
this is our dashboard. This is our introductory screen. Um, to build a segment, you can see it's very clean. Um, I can click my uh, audience tab to have a peek and um, uh, see what my, uh, my audience looks like. And you can see down here, it's, it's uh, segmenting this by uh, both anonymous and identified audience. Most associations have an enormous anonymous audience, people who aren't members, uh, uh, you don't actually know who they are, but one nice thing about HUM is you can still personalize for them. Uh, to build a segment, you simply click on a segment item, create a segment, you're gonna name it. I'm looking for engaged managers. And I now specify what I'm looking for. So I'm interested in people who have an engagement score and whose job title has the word manager. Includes manager. And I could add more conditions if I wanted. Uh, you may have noticed there was a Boolean option. So you can do and or or. Um, so it's now generating that segment from my sandbox data. I'm actually going to go back to the, uh, the, all the segments for a second. I'm, this is a bit like Martha Stewart. Uh, it can take about a minute to do that, and we only have uh, 10. So I'm going to just run in here and pull out of the oven uh, the, um, the segment that I built uh, a little bit earlier. And what I've done now is uh, pulled and I was, uh, 165 people in the database who met those criteria. I, and I just wanted you to know one thing about these criteria, emerging behavioral data, that is things they've been doing on my digital properties. Um, they've been taking courses, they've been looking at my blog, they've been uh, reading articles or opening newsletters, opening emails from me. They've engaged in ways that, that allow me to quantify that engagement with demographic data. That is to say, in this case, their job title. So that's an example of, of uh, how we uh, build segments in HUM. And I uh, hope you can see how that's uh, kind of a, a, a new and useful thing. Um, once you have uh, done that, uh, you then build a campaign in HUM. Um, and, and a growth campaign, it, we would do via lookalike audiences. So in this case, you, um, you, you take people who are uh, managers who are engaged and you give uh, LinkedIn a list of those people and you say, introduce me to a lot of people who look like this, but are not these people. And uh, you can run that campaign in HUM as well. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm just in the interest of time, I'm not going to show you that screen, but the, you can build campaigns in HUM. Those will feed out to your marketing technology and uh, allow you to monitor those. Uh, they're very easily done. It's a kind of a point and click interface. Um, this is kind of what it looks like. Uh, so this is not live. This is a, a, but it's an example. So here we were building something where we wanted people who looked like people who had successfully taken a course on digital event strategy. Uh, and you can see the, the program ran over time. It was a Facebook campaign. Uh, you could add other campaign sources down here. Um, and so, uh, and in this case, we, we, were, uh, we were feeding them some content, who feels the most Zoom fatigued and why, uh, in an effort to um, get them interested in, in, in clicking on the link. Um, once you run the campaign, uh, uh, you can run an ad campaign as well. Uh, this is what that might look like in this case. Uh, so you run ads, this helps with awareness. All of this data, again, being collected by HUM. And then you personalize the experience of your, uh, your, your people who are coming to your website as a result. So when somebody comes to your website, as a result of this campaign, you can present them, you know where they're coming from, you know what they're interested in, even if you don't yet know who they are, even if they're unidentified. And you can present them with personalized uh, content. Um, we, uh, and I won't show you our website, we use the right rail for that. So once we know a little about someone, what topic they're interested in, that's what we serve. It's very much like Netflix. Uh, you might be interested in these sorts of things based on your content. 
Once we've done that, we then run an engagement campaign, which nurtures these people through, in this case, through uh, signing up for a course or to full membership. Uh, and um, all of this, again, using real-time real -time behavior. Uh, here's an example of what an engagement campaign would look like uh, in HUM. This is the HUM interface again. And, um, uh, and this is an example of the sorts of personalized emails you can send out using our widgets. So the personalization on the website, on blogs, um, in email is all done via widgets. So here's an email to somebody talking about the value of their membership, how many articles they read last month, how many courses they've taken, how it compared to the month before. And if you have uh, people who actually cluster into um, into uh, groups. So uh, this is a, a, a client who's got um, uh, 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 branches and each branch has members. Uh, the branch managers can also get a thing that it's a roll up for everybody in their organization. And this just helps demonstrate the value that associations are providing. So I've talked about one use case here. You can see there are lots of other ones. Uh, a lot of them involve content, number four in particular, uh, which is about setting up a media program. Um, you cannot do this without a CDP. Uh, you absolutely need to be able to get this data out. Getting data into something is easy. Um, getting it harmonized is hard. Getting it out in a way that you can actually action the insights is the hardest of them. And you do need help with that. And I'm, um, what we're proud of with our CDP is that it's built for associations. The interface is designed for associations. Um, and uh, one thing I didn't show you, but uh, is also important is that not only do we categorize the behavior of people and watch that, we also watch content itself. So we can always tell you what the top performing content is. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thanks. I, I appreciate that, John. That was, that was a good presentation. I was very, uh, I was really interested in that because um, at the American College of Chess Physicians, we did a big data project and 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 uh, back in the day. And so, you know, what I see you doing is looking at different audiences and different groups and really trying to uh, understand a lot of their tendencies so that, so that associations can then use that to serve up a lot of things. I, I, I like the four use cases that you showed. I'd like to hear a little bit more about them, but unfortunately, we're a little short on time. Um, a real quick question, though, is you know, does CDP replace an existing part of the association's tech stack or is it really an addition to piece? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, uh, there are some things you could get rid of if you had a CDP. Uh, so for example, you arguably would never need to run another survey. Hmm. So if you're running a survey tool, you could quite possibly get rid of that. Um, I would say in general, unless you're running a full uh, analytic, you know, data lake analytics stack and you wanted to, to downspec from that, um, this is probably as well as, but it can allow you to down spec other software. So if you use a CDP, mm -hmm. you could easily get away with MailChimp and not have to use Marketo. And that's, okay. that's an enormous cost. To say. Yeah, no, that's a, that, that's a great point. Thank you very much. Well, listen, John, thanks for, for the presentation. And, and uh, we'll try to get to some more questions here after the last presentation and do some Q&A. Um, and, and now, so, so now I'm going to turn it over to our, our next speakers. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Joanna Pineda, who I think actually has the best uh, title uh, as Chief Troublemaker and CEO, uh, and also Brian Clark, Director of Strategic Partnerships. Uh, they're at the Matrix Group International. And if you're wondering which events to keep in the virtual stream, Joanna and Brian are going to give you some advice. So I'm going to turn it over to you guys, and uh, we'll go from there. Can you hear us okay? I can hear you. Unclear. Great. All right. Well, thanks so much. Um, you know, when we were thinking about this presentation, we thought, you know, what, what lessons do we have from this year of the plague, as Walter Isaacson called, calls it? And, you know, we, 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 we spend a lot of time thinking about, you know, virtual events, about, invent, about events in general. And so we came up with this presentation. So just, you know, one minute about us, Brian, if you go to the next slide. Um, you know, Matrix Group is a digital agency. We work almost exclusively with associations and nonprofits, and we help them increase their membership and generate revenue. And we do it through all of these services, primarily mobile, 
um, web, um, you know, AMS, and now a virtual conference platform. And Brian, if you go to the next slide, um, we've got a virtual conference platform called Bespeak that it's really a set of technologies and as well as a set of services that we kind of deploy to help organizations put on hopefully what are really bespoke or custom meetings that generate revenue and make attendees and sponsors happy. So, but enough about that, let's talk a little bit about, you know, what are some of the lessons from the pandemic? And as we go into kind of the next season, what, what, what events should remain or what lessons should we, you know, should we keep? You know, we're thinking about this, we're, we're starting to be back in person. I'm going to a conference next week in Nashville, and then I'm going to an event in Boston. And this is an actual picture from one of the last conferences I attended in at the end of 2019. So this is me talking and you see nobody's in the front row and some people look interested and some people don't look interested and there's probably a bunch of people close to the back or on their phones and the question is like if we're being honest with ourselves um, was this really a great experience there's no question that being in person is terrific because we get to connect with everybody but there are probably a lot of kind of elements from the in-person conferences that weren't so great. Um, I had one client say, you know, some of the presentations that our speakers are giving, now that we're able to watch them because they're being recorded or because they're in the virtual platform, they're saying things like, wow, some of these presentations really aren't that good. Um, it, we also have clients who say, gosh, you know, when we're in person, we put people in a big room where they're looking at a screen and they're on their phones. So virtually they're looking at a screen and maybe they're on their phones. But what have we learned from this pandemic and what types of events should continue to be virtual or maybe go hybrid? So, you know, number one, Brian, if you go to the next slide is, um, well, actually, you know, just, just to step back, now's the time to really rethink your strategy because I think that what we're seeing from the surveys from our clients is that about really, you know, the, 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 the vast majority of, of survey respondents say that they really wanna be back in person. But we're seeing anywhere from 15 to 30% of the attendees say, look, we, we would like to remain virtual. So that's kind of interesting stats, right? That's a majority of the attendees who say we wanna be back in person, but that's still, in some cases, you know, if it's 30%, it's a pretty large number of people who say I want to be virtual for a variety of reasons. And depending on the size of your conference, if you have 10, 15, 20% of the people say I want to stay virtual, and you don't have a virtual component, that might mean that the meeting isn't as successful, doesn't generate as much revenue. Go to the next slide, Brian. So, um, you know, what are we learning from attendees? Have the attendee needs changed? And, um, you know, have the sponsorship and, and exhibitor needs changed? And, you know, I think what we're finding is that they haven't changed. For the most part, members still want to attend these conferences. They still want to get education. They still want to expand their networks. They still want to connect with their peers. If you have exhibitors and sponsors, for the most part, they still want to connect with attendees. They want to generate leads. They want to show that they have solutions. They want to show thought leadership and they want to make connections. So those needs haven't changed, but our environment has changed. If you go to the next slide, Brian. So what should endure? What we are hearing from our clients is that conferences and events that are much more focused on the education. So maybe it's a legal conference where it's an update on what's happening in, in a specific environment. Um, but, but anything that's really very focused on education, we are finding clients are saying, maybe we should keep those virtual because we really expand the number of people who can attend. We expand the kind of the footprint of, of our trade association members because they we can go deeper into the organizations we also have some folks who are still very constrained by travel or will never have the budget so if if the meeting is not so much the b2b events we're finding those those people are really kind of in a hurry to be back in person but events focus on education you know we're seeing a trend that they're going to stay virtual at the very least they're going to go hybrid next one brian um workshops, the ones that are like half a day or a day. Um, what we are seeing is clients are saying, you know, it's a lot of money to put on a half a day workshop, have people fly in for the day. We actually have a client that puts together a couple times a year, a one day workshop and people come in from all over the world. And today those attendees are saying, boy, 
you know, in this environment, we really don't want to be traveling for a one day workshop from halfway across the world or halfway across the country. So we're seeing those stay virtual or at the very least go virtual, um, go hybrid. You know, um, job fairs and residency fairs, what we are hearing from our clients is those are actually perfect candidates for keeping virtual. We did a, a residency fair for the American Academy for Colleges of Podri Podiatric Medicine and the programs themselves, about 75% said, wow, um, we'd like to be in person and 25, 30% said we'd like to stay virtual. But for the most part, the program said this is a really good opportunity to connect with the students. But we found on the flip side, 80, 85% of the students said, wow, this should remain virtual because mm -hmm. it, was, it was less money, um, it was less time consuming. And then in the time available, they were able to explore so many more programs. If you think about it, if you, if you do it right and really give the, the programs or the employers opportunities to really connect with the attendees, you really can have some very meaningful connections. Not to mention the fact that if you've got candidates from around the country, um, you're taking away the time constraints, you're taking away the cost constraints. Um, I have a story for you about staff meeting. This is a picture of what, you know, we, what, or, you know, how we held staff meeting before the pandemic. So we have a large conference room with a big table and you'll see you've got people kind of sitting around the table and you've got people sitting around the table and you see on the left, there are folks who are remote, um, you know, dialing over Zoom from all over the country. And then on the right is what we were sharing. And what I found was really, without really thinking about it, that there's, there's almost a hierarchy that, that develops. You've got kind of people in the inner circle, you've got people in the outer circle, and then you've got people who are remote. And, um, it, you know, what, what, what you find is that, you um, it, it, it sometimes constrains folks. They don't want to participate because they're remote or because maybe they're kind of hanging out in the back of the room. I, as a CEO, have decided that staff meetings should remain virtual because when staff meeting is on Zoom, everybody's a little, is, is a little square. And it's really kind of made the staff meetings a lot more equitable, if you will. So we've decided as an organization that even as we trickle back into the office, we're going to keep staff meetings, you know, virtual. Um, we're also finding that volunteer events, committee events, that if you make those virtual, you have higher participation. So we're hearing, for example, from organizations and from schools, for example, that say, wow, when we took our parent-teacher meetings virtual, we had more participation from the parents. When we took our back-to-school night virtual, more parents could attend. When we held our planning commit planning meetings for our big gala, we had more participation. So we're, we're probably seeing that those types of meetings, again, if you can run them well, you know, are going to stay virtual because you can have more participation by, by the attendees. Um, I already mentioned that parent-teacher conferences. I've, I've got parent-teacher conferences tonight and thank God it's going to be virtual because it's going to allow me to not have to worry about, you know, keeping the kids at home, but it also is also going to allow me to quickly move between all the different classrooms. So if your school district is not doing parent-teacher conferences, um, you know, remote, you know, tell them, hey, you know, let, let, let's go for a change. Brian, what else do you think should endure? Well, I, uh, you know, it's simply that uh, I've attended a lot of different uh, conferences and so forth. Um, uh, a lot of the sponsorship opportunities for smaller meetings, uh, I, I think is actually almost better to be uh, virtual as well, uh, while big, long, multi-day uh, um, conferences, um, or get yield better results uh, from a like a sponsor and exhibitor standpoint. Uh, you know, having that opportunity, especially like forums like this, to be able to uh, sit, have a quick meeting, share a little bit about what we're learning, a little bit what we do, and uh, having to be able to participate from an exhibitor standpoint uh, for uh, you know, like small uh, one hour, three hour, two hour sessions and so forth is a fabulous way to stay virtual as well. I feel like I get so much more productivity and opportunities to meet additional people, have conversations, and share some of our knowledge as well. Yeah, and then just, you know, to close this out, other things that we think should endure is, 
you know, in the virtual space, I think everybody's worked really hard to kind of make the sessions a lot more interesting, more beautiful, you know, have kind of higher production value. We think that should, that should stay. And in fact, I'm speaking next week and I told my team, I want pre-roll, I want this, I want that. I want the session to be kind of, you know, more engaging. We have amazing analytics from the virtual meetings. We think that conference organizers as well as exhibitors are gonna say, where are my analytics, even as you go back in person. Um, we think that the meetings landscape is gonna to continue to evolve to accommodate the differing needs. So maybe you'll have, you know, hybrid meetings that look very, very different from the hybrid meetings that we've had, you know, this past year. And then finally, you know, it's really about fostering engagement and conversation. And we've had a lot of meeting planners say to us, in person, we would kind of focus on the education and then kind of create a few opportunities for people to engage. And then it was really up to people to kind of engage and network. But virtually, you have to be so much more intentional with the matchmaking, with the engagement so that people do make connections. And we think that that should continue, that conference organizers should still should continue to say, how do we make sure that every last person feels really connected to other people? And how do we make sure that the first timers really do feel like they, they, they connected to, you know, to the conference? So I think we got time for a few questions. And then Brian, I think what you're gonna pull up our, our contact information. And if people have questions, um, we spend a lot of time thinking about this stuff. If you just wanna be part of the conversation, if you would wanna do some brainstorming, you know, um, you know, let us know. Brian, next slide. I think that's got our contact info. Do we have any questions? All right. Well, thanks, Joanna. Thanks, Brian. Um, yeah, I do. Have, I've got a few questions. We've got a couple of minutes here. So I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, get a couple to you. You had mentioned um, hybrid. Uh, you know, really, what kind of events do you feel in your experience make sense to go hybrid versus staying completely virtual? Yeah, so there's a couple of reasons to go hybrid. One is if you do have people who won't come, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you also, if you really want to expand the reach of the conference, then you go hybrid. If you've got a really international audience, I think international travel is probably going to be challenging for a while. Mm -hmm. So those, those types of events should go hybrid. And what's interesting about, about hybrid is hybrid is different for every organization. We have some clients um, that are doing things like, like we actually have one client that's going to have an in-person conference and we're going to record everything. And then they're going to make things available kind of simu live two weeks later with the speakers available. So that's one version of hybrid. Another version of hybrid is you have the same workshop, you hold one in person, you hold one virtually, and then you kind of see which one people want to attend. And then you've got hybrid hybrid where you've got the speakers are maybe in person and virtual and you've got attendees who are uh, um, in person and virtual. And then the question is, how do you blend all of that? So I think you're going to have different types of formats, again, depending on the type of education that you want to deliver and the type of interactions that you want to have between attendees and between exhibitors and attendees. And I'll tell you one challenging thing with hybrid is if you're an exhibitor, how do you decide to split your time? Are you in person? Are you virtual? Are you both? And if you're both, you're both, obviously now you've got some choices to make about how you're going to spend your time. That's, that's great insights. Appreciate that. Um, you know, the other thing is, you know, how, how do you, you know, here we are, we're on a zoom. How, how do you combat zoom fatigue? I think we, we all, everybody on this, this panel has probably experienced that. And so have our members and, and, and our faculty and our volunteers. Yeah, so everyone talks about Zoom fatigue, and there was a recent study that said a whole lot of the Zoom fatigue is we're tired of seeing ourselves. So if you, you know, right click on your little square and take off your video so you're not looking at yourself, so it feels more natural. I'm in a room with, you know, six people, I'm seeing them. But kind of our solution is you combat Zoom fatigue by creating events that have a lot of surprises and a lot of variety. So if everything is you're in a black kind of environment with little squares and all you can do is really kind of comment. Then at the end of three days, eight hours of that, you're like, oh my God, how many more sessions can I attend? But if you mix it up so that maybe there's some sessions that have breakouts or some sessions that are all on video, there are some sessions that are more, you know, watching and then, you know, responding with the comments. Maybe there are some sessions where you're, 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 you're doing different things. We did a, 
we did a, a, a kickoff this morning for a client where it was a live stream and then everyone went into breakouts where they were matched up with five other people and they did an icebreaker and then they did an escape room. So they had an opportunity to kind of listen to great content, but kind of meet some new folks because you didn't know who you were going to be matched up with. Plus you did something social. So in our mind, um, higher production value on the session so that it's not just, you know, squares. So it's a mix of different things and then variety in the program. But also you've got to give the program breathing room. So we spend a lot of time with our clients looking at the program to say, do you have enough breaks or do you have too many breaks? So for certain types of sessions, we'll actually recommend. So for example, if you're doing um, education to breakouts, you can't have a break. You got to go right into the breakout or you'll lose people. But if you're going education to education, people want a break. So in that case, we say, give them at least a 10 minute break. So there are different things like that that we're seeing that seem to work better than others. All right. So Joanne, this is Kevin. I have an interesting surprise. We have a client who has their, uh, I think it's a three day annual meeting this week, all virtual. Um, and what they did was they did a dueling piano virtual session. <laughs> and when they were telling me about this, I was like, oh, so how many people stayed? They said they had over 2000 people stay wow. and participate in the, uh, this dueling piano session. Uh, so most of us probably experienced that, you know, in person. <laughs> <laughs> at night uh, <laughs> with some some colleagues, but this was, uh, I think it was the mid-morning break and yeah. huh. they had a ball and they had people were like dancing around and submitting requests and singing along. And So you're telling us to get dueling pianos. Yeah, so <laughs> with that in mind, let's... Uh, let's... <laughs> you know, I think that part of that is if you add those types of touches to your events, then it makes something different. So we have a client that like last year they did, they decided to do Jeopardy, but the questions were all related to the accreditation process. So they plucked three random people to put them on video and then they play Jeopardy. And it was so popular that first they did it during the break. And then people were like, what? I missed it because I thought it was a break. And so now it's a session because it's so popular and it's one of the most well attended sessions. So you just never know. We had one client that did um, they call it the enrichment lounge. And in the enrichment lounge, they had a combination of like social things, health and wellness, and then topical things. And what we found was the health and wellness topics actually resonated. Some of the really serious topics got nobody in there. And then some of the fun sessions actually got people like the improv had like 80 people. Um, the journaling had a max of, I think, 12 and that maxed out. So people are just looking for different experiences. And I, we think that's yeah. part of how you combat Zoom fatigue. Yeah, I think Garrett might be able to pop in here, but I know Valir is doing a program, um, I believe it's next Thursday. Um, and it's kind of a, a wine tasting with a short presentation. And I raised my hand. I said, I'm in. <laughs> Yeah. It might be at five, five o'clock or six o'clock, I think our time in Chicago, but this sounded good to me. Yeah, yeah. it's, it's six oh. o'clock Eastern, but uh, it's, uh, we're having, uh, um, we're having wine and charcuterie shipped to all of our uh, attendees and um, we're, we're sandwiching uh, two different wine tastings. Um, we're putting in the middle of that a, a talk about um uh, just uh, a couple of case studies that we have have done with a couple of different associations um, in uh, in the in the on the Sitecore platform, just to kind of talk about how they've kind of managed their um, uh, you know some of the learnings and findings and in, in managing their membership through the pandemic, and have a couple of bottles of wine uh, on either yeah. side. And you, <laughs> people probably love it because they're getting the education, they're getting kind of the meal or the the you know kind of the feel of an event. But they didn't have to battle traffic, mm -hmm. right? And they didn't have childcare, so that's probably going to be a big hit. And yeah, the, the day being on Zoom all day, I figure we need some wine, and it sounded good. <laughs> also, drink as much wine as you want. You don't have to drive home. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's the first time we've done something like this, but the response has been positive, so we're excited to to see how it goes. And we'll, we'll absolutely. We're, we're, I mean, you're all more than welcome to join as well. I'll send. I'll share the uh, the invite, but. Um, uh, I, um, I, I, we're excited about it. So we'll see how it goes. Yeah, I think what, 
what what I'm hearing from that is that like you guys are experimenting and we think that everybody should be experimenting. We have some clients that are just like, we're going to try everything. And some things are just total failures. Like we did, we did a, um, a conference for the Catholic Health Association and we had these different lounges and they had this one lounge, they were called system lounges where they thought, oh, people from the same health network will want to connect with each other. Nobody went into them. Like the people from Ascension didn't want to network with the other people from Ascension. So we're like, okay, well, that was an experiment that like now we know, so we're going to do other things. And we think that we have to be doing those things. Yeah, for sure. Um, so in the, in the few minutes that, that we have, um, we brought everybody back. If you guys have any questions, um, please just put them in the Q&A. Uh, but I wanted to start off, we didn't have time during the first um, presentation uh, with Doug, you know, Doug, we recently, we mentioned started a podcast. It's been interesting that it's, um, it's getting much more um, viewership or listening, listenership, what if that's a word, um, than I expected. But, you know, I think all of us here is in the business of, you know, content strategy, content distribution. Can you talk to us a little bit about um, if you can use or how you guys use um, your videos and like be able to produce podcasts. It's kind of an ongoing fight or battle between myself and my team. Like we're creating videos. Why can't we reproduce? Like we can, but they're, they're like, it's not as good. Um, but maybe you have some ideas or thoughts about that. Oh yeah. Like, uh, first of all, can you guys hear me? I turned my camera off. Thank you for that tip. That was awesome. Uh, I don't need to look at myself anymore. Um, anyway. Uh, yeah. Like, for the podcast, like you've got the hosts down, right? And when you have that, there's always that recurring theme. And I'm not sure who listens to podcasts, but I'm, I'm big on them for almost anything, sports, business, you name it, music. Um, anyway, once you have that recurring theme in place and you guys, you know, Kevin, you mentioned 200 plus long form content. It's so easy to go to audio from stuff you already have. And as you're doing your content calendar for your podcast, think about like, what do we have in the books now and how can we plug that into this podcast now of course it works for future sessions that you're recording and like you know plug for virtual videographer it makes it easy but it doesn't have to be new either it can be stuff that's existing and you're redirecting people to your online platform with all that great content so you're um, a lot of the stuff that i love about dot org community is a lot of the content's evergreen there was that pivot obviously for 2020 but yeah. A lot of that's turned into evergreen. Like, look what Matrix Group was just talking about. There's a new normal and there's a new meeting style, right? And things people were learning in 2020, you could push them back to that. So I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but um, when you have that video there, you can reuse that later, super simply. And it's just a matter of recurring themes. Start with that strategy. And then when you're plugging in the pieces, sometimes you don't need to recreate. You just need to reuse or recycle. So yeah. Um, that's my take on that, but I've got lots of other ideas. I'll just stop there. <laughs> That's great. Um, so um, let me see if we, there's any other questions we have. Um, uh, I think we've, so, uh, to Valir, you know, I want to hear a little bit more about um, how much accessibility is enough for our organizations. I know my marketing um, VP sent an, a note to us and said, we now need to look at accessibility. So <laughs> what is enough, especially for like myself as a small business owner or some of this, a lot of the people on this on the um, meeting today are small associations. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. You know, I think um, the it it varies a little bit by organization. I think what you want to agree on is whether you're going for a single A, double A, triple A on the on the WCAG standards and and taking a look at what that means and and assessing what the gap is between where you are now and and what you um, you know what you what you're looking to uh, to achieve there. Um, uh, the um, in terms of assessing what's enough is usually a process of understanding what you need to do to get from point A to, to point Z and, and creating, um, you know, realistic and, and achievable but ambitious milestones to get there. 
Um, and, and so I think that if you are going through um, the process of, of getting to those getting to those levels, you, you should see results you know, fairly quickly. It's, it's something where you can, you can make a difference and you can start to achieve that impact. I think it's also, um, I, I think to my, one of the last points I had made in our, our presentation was there's also, you're not really ever done because once you post a new blog post or a new report or create a, a new section of your site, um, uh, you're, you have to be asking yourselves the same questions you did, you know, when you started this journey, you know, like what, what, um, you know, is my content at the right reading level? Do I have the right structures in, in place for this new template? Have the guidelines changed? You know, they, they, uh, they evolve and it's something that, um, you know, we're constantly doing research to stay on top of, um, you know, it's a practice we've had to turn from taking, um, you know, a, a couple of a couple of people that, you know, kind of stay on top of the various disciplines to carving out proactive time for, you know, key people at our agency to, to stay on top of what what's new and, and what the implications of these things are, you know, it's kind of like, uh, it, it almost feels similar to, to making sure we understand Google's algorithm, um, where it's just making sure that we're staying on top of things. So I think I think that if you have a if, if an association, it, takes the um, investment of time to put a plan in place and set goals, um, it becomes more of a habit than a, than a project and something that you constantly make sure to, to uh, pay attention to and, and talk about. And that, that to me is, is healthy. And that to me is, is what I would call enough is that it's a part of the regular conversation and how you assess your own digital footprint. Yeah, I had a conversation with somebody yesterday and they said, the organization just launched a website and they're new to the organization. And so they started seeing things in a different lens. And it was one of these moments of, well, for us, where a website or any digital experience, just because you've launched like that to us, like that's just the beginning, right? We're always can make improvements. We can always look at, you know, some things behind a firewall, you know, and we need to donate. Now we've just made that user experience very difficult, those types of things. And Brian and Joanna and, and you and Brad could probably talk about that all day long. <laughs> you know, just making sure that, like you said, somebody is kind of keeping a, a lens and, and a focus on what is the hurdles in our overall user. And we always say, you know, who's in charge of that? And there may be more than one person but making that a priority for the organization. Um, and John, you know, before we kind of wrap up before, um, unless we have any other questions from the audience, uh, same kind of similar question for you. Like, how do we get started? Like, how do we kind of, you know, uh, just start small and, and, and grow with, um, you know, with uh, analytics and, and such? Data and analytics, yeah. So yeah. Step one is, um, uh, I think there are two things you need to start with. One is an honest assessment of kind of where you are in the data journey. Mm -hmm. We use kind of a five uh, phase uh, rubric to kind of get a sense of where folks are at. Um, quite truthfully, you know, most people are in sort of phases one, two, or three. Very rare you find anybody who's sort of, you know, already strategically using data. So that's one. Uh, and then the second is to do um, uh, is to sort of a formulate a data strategy, which includes all those things that you need to think about, including governance, uh, which of course is very important. Um, but also, you know, what 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 you what you're and marrying that to your business goal. So you shouldn't have a data strategy that is in any way divorced for or not aligned with with your association goal. Um, we. We help people with that. That's sort of the very first thing we do um, with with our clients. We do data audits for folks. That's that's one of the things we do right up front uh, to help them sort of see what they've already got, uh, what they're missing that they could use. There's no point in collecting data you're not going to use. Uh, I think every organization probably has an analog equivalent of that some form. Uh, I, I was talking to a client this morning. He's like, "Yeah, we we have a and I'm not kidding you a 32 page form." we ask people uh, who are registering for this event to fill out. And one of the questions <laughs> is about the print material that we provide. And we haven't provided print material for 10 years. But you just can't, you know, it's hard to get rid of those things sometimes. And so uh, 
it's a nice opportunity to go with some spring cleaning and, and rethink things. But the thing to remember about data and analytics is you can all of a sudden do stuff that you could only, you know, you couldn't even have dreamt of before. That's, that's the heart of a digital transformation. You get started looking at what you want to accomplish, what you're doing right now, and thinking about what do I need to do to get to the next step. And it's, um, yeah, it's one step at a time, like anything else. And, and the other thing I'll say, and, and um, I think um, uh, maybe Garrett and Brad mentioned this earlier, um, you know, data is a way of life. You know, it's not something you do once and you're done. It's not a project. It's, it's a way of life. It's, you're gonna be doing this, thinking about data and being data forward and, and, and data thoughtful. That's, that's a lifestyle decision. Every association is gonna to need to do it or they're gonna be irrelevant soon. Yeah. So time to get started. For sure. And Brian, I'll let you have the final um, thought for, for the day for us to, before we wrap up. No, I appreciate it. And this was a fun collection of people that come to the, came to this. I mean, it was a nice uh, to kind of explore uh, the different areas. And uh, Sherry, I'll actually uh, kind of mirror you. I think uh, in wrap up and in, in conclusion, uh, ultimately, I think all of us are all really just kind of focused on like the journeys, defining yeah. the journeys, what we're trying to do. It doesn't matter if it's meeting oriented, uh, website oriented, uh, data, uh, whatever the case is. But again, it all, all boils down to those journeys, understanding what we're trying to achieve, what, understanding those goals and uh, you know how can we solve them. Well, we, um, we appreciate all of you guys sharing your knowledge today. Uh, it was great. As we said, we will, um, this will be recorded. It'll be on videos.orgcommunity.com. We'll also send the link in the presentations out to those that registered. Uh, we appreciate Steve hosting for us today. And um, we look forward to seeing all of you. We are doing a Another webinar next month with um, Worker Bee TV. So stay tuned for information and registration on that. And as we mentioned, our um, cross our fingers, hybrid, blended, whatever we wanna call it event in November um, where um, all the folks on this uh, meeting will be there as well as some others. Um, so we're really looking forward to that. So appreciate everybody's time and those that hung in with us um, for the full time today. We appreciate it and we will see you soon. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks.